My name is Sam Vaknin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, Edition 5, includes addiction to coffee. It also includes alcoholism, addiction to alcohol, or abuse of alcohol. I don't want to encourage these tendencies among you. So today, I'm going to drink water. Water is nature's own champagne. And I'm going to drink it from a clear, beautiful, large glass. Cheers. We are all living, we, we all took a time travel, and we are all in BC. No, not before Christ, before coronavirus. And we all hope to survive into AD. No, not Anno Domini, but after distancing. Today I'm going to, as has become my habit, I'm going to review latest developments, some of the news, and in the second half of our fire, fireside chats, in the second half of this fireside chat, we are going to, to, I'm going to introduce you to some basic epidemiological concepts, which are lost even on experts. I'm utterly shocked that public health officials, in public appearances, confuse fatality with mortality, mortality with morbidity, and, and a zillion other concepts. I want to make order in all this, so that in the future uh, you can form your own informed opinions. But let's start with um, some of the news. The University of Washington has revised its, pro its projection. Now it says that only 60,000 Americans will die by the end of August. It used to be 84,000 only two days ago. So either the model has been used inappropriately or there has been a massive change in trend. I also don't believe that 60,000 Americans will die. Remember that only a week ago it was 200,000? Birks? Birks appeared in a White House briefing and said that she thinks uh, upward of 200,000 Americans are going to die. Then Fauci dialed it down to 100,000. Then the University of Washington model, upon which the White House bases its decision, projected 84,000 and now it's 60,000. I hope they're going to converge with reality. Reality is an interesting concept, and many of these public health officials would benefit from getting, getting acquainted with it from time to time. I think the real figure is closer to 30,000. I think the number of fatalities in the United States of COVID-19, uh, the number of fatalities is going to equal the number of, of fatalities in a typical year from a bad seasonal flu. And in a typical year in the United States, 30 to 40,000 adults, uh, people, die of the flu. So it's going to be like a very bad flu season, for example, like the flu season in 2009. Trump uh, yesterday criticized a small country in Europe called Sweden. He said that Sweden is using the wrong model. Um, Sweden, to remind you, abstains from social distancing and isolation. Everything basically, well, almost everything is basically open, with the exception of bars and so on. Markets are open, schools are open, everything is open. In charge of the policy, there's an epidemiologist, a famous epidemiologist, a very courageous man. And he is going against the global trend and the recommendations of everyone. And he does not recommend masks. By the way, the WHO, the World Health Organization, also does not recommend masks. He is dead set against social distancing and so on and so forth. And Trump criticized Sweden yesterday. He said they made a mistake. There are horrible deaths there. I have no idea what Trump is talking about. And as usual, I doubt very much that Trump knows what Trump is talking about. In Sweden actually has the lowest infection rate in Scandinavia. It has the highest death rate, but the lowest infection rate. Let's look at the figures. Denmark, a neighbor of Sweden, one bridge across, has 933 infected people and 38 dead per million. Norway has 1,215 infected and 19 dead per million. Sweden has 834, much lower than Denmark and Norway, 834 people infected 
and 68 dead per million. So the number of dead in Sweden is double that of Denmark and three times that of Norway. So you can say, well, clearly this policy is fatal. It's a lethal policy. Well, it's not true. It's not true because people in Sweden had been infected long before people in Denmark and Norway had been exposed. And this has happened precisely because Sweden remained open. Sweden kept itself open. It didn't block its borders. It didn't institute social distancing. It didn't shut down its institutions and it did not destroy its economy, which I think is a good thing. So because it's been open, many people got infected long before Norway and Denmark, which immediately instituted all these measures. We are just seeing a lag in the incubation period. What I'm trying to say is that shortly in both Denmark and Norway, we're going to see a spike in deaths and they're going to surpass Sweden. The interesting thing is that the number of infected in Sweden, in Sweden, despite the fact that there is no social distancing, the number of infected is much lower than anywhere else in Scandinavia and even lower than the United States. One of the reasons Norway stands out is that is the geography. Geography matters, especially in, in epidemics and pandemics. Norway is all mountains and fjords. It has few urban centers. It's essentially a rustic country. People f live um, far apart anyhow. Social distancing is woven into the fabric of uh, Norwegian society. And it's been there long before the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's small wonder that Norway is getting away with it. Another bit of interesting news is uh, PBS, which is my favorite news source. PBS, PBS interviewed a doctor, a uh, courageous woman, female doctor, um, ER, emergency room doctor. She, she caught COVID-19 from, from her patients while in the front line and she survived it. She had recovered from COVID-19 and she, in the interview, she describes her experiences and her symptoms. And one of the fascinating things she says is that she thinks that many of her symptoms during the recovery were actually not SARS related. They were not related to the virus, but they were a type of panic or anxiety attack. So people say, yeah, but how can you confuse COVID-19 and a panic or anxiety attack? COVID-19 has clear objective manifestations. There's, for example, fibrosis, fibrotic or fibrosis of the lungs. I mean, you can see it in, in MRIs and so on. You can't see an MRI, a panic attack in MRI, but you can see a badly damaged lung in MRI. That's true, but this applies only to people who are already hospitalized. I'm not talking about these people. I'm referring to people who stay at home. Stay at home and they have shortness of breath or they, they have other symptoms, which are typical of panic attacks and anxiety attacks. The media globally, and especially in the United States, are doing their best to foster panic. It's good for business. They are able to increase the number of eyeballs and monetize these eyeballs. Advertising revenues, ironically, are going up. So it's, the panic and the pandemic are good for... Nothing better happened to the media, to the global media, than this pandemic. If you want a conspiracy theory, here it is. The global media hired biologists to create the virus <laughs> because it saved them, literally saved them. I'm kidding, of course. I... I... I'm not a fan of conspiracy theories, and I hold conspiracy theorists, the people who believe and propagate conspiracy theories, uh, I hold a very dim view of them. Um, they are equally divided between the feeble-minded and the narcissistic, grandiose. The only 5G I see in, in, in cahoots or in conjunction with COVID-19, the only 5G, is greed, grandiosity, globalization, goofiness, and gullibility. There's no conspiracy of any kind. There's just gross incompetence. Incompetence by medical professionals. Incompetence by health healthcare officials. Incompetence by hospitals 
who were not ready for this pretty minimal spike, incompetence by politicians and incompetence by leaders who are leading from behind, who are reactive to social media and to conspiracy theories. You see, there are two types of conspiracy theories, the qui bono theory and the side effect theory. The qui bono conspiracy theory is asking the question, who benefits? Who benefits from the pandemic? Well, clearly, big pharma is going to benefit from the pandemics. Pharmaceutical companies, the media, they are benefiting from the pandemics. Some politicians, power grabs, they rendered themselves dictators. They benefited from the pandemic. But qui bono is a logical fallacy. And this logical fallacy is known as post hoc propter hoc. If B follows A, it doesn't mean that A was the cause of B. And it definitely doesn't mean that B engineered A. A and B could be utterly unrelated. A pandemic may have started, and then people said to themselves, how can I benefit from it? They don't need to have started the pandemic. They don't need to have engineered a bioweapon. They don't need, didn't need to install 5G towers and all the rest of the unmitigated rank nonsense out there. They are just riding, surfing the wave. They're just benefiting. And then there's a whole group, the majority, of incompetence, people who should lose their jobs after this is over. So it's a confluence, a poisonous, toxic confluence of incompetence, selfishness, greed, and all the other Gs I mentioned. Which gives me an excuse to dwell upon my favorite topic, conspiracy theories. Conspiracism is the propensity to believe in unproven and unverified, oft-repeated conspiracy theories, urban legends, myths, and patent falsehoods, usually involving an evil intent of a cabal to abuse, manipulate, and exploit the unsuspecting masses. I mentioned the qui bono conspiracy theory, and then there's the side effect conspiracy theory. There was actually something sinister and bad and evil and dark going on, and then it got out of control. A bioweapon was being developed in some laboratory in China. How would the masses know about it? I have no idea. And it, it escaped the laboratory. This kind of, of trash. So most people are gullible. They believe literally anything and anyone. A well-documented and thoroughly researched phenomenon. We even have a name for it in psychology. It's called the base rate. The fact, the amazing fact is 95% of people in numerous studies believe anything and everything they are told immediately and without checking it. And again, it's called the base rate. You can go online and read about it. Then, once they have adopted the belief or the conspiracy theory, they defend their misconceptions fiercely as they actively align themselves with others and signal their uncritical conformity in like-minded tribes and silos. Frequent, frequently, the exposure in these echo chambers to toxic nonsense solidifies the belief in these outlandish and inane narratives, a phenomenon knows, known as consistency. Social media leverage consistency. Um, this is grist to their perpetuum mobile rumor and gossip mills. Other cognitive distortions feed into conspiracism. Consider the proportionality bias, the erroneous conviction that great events are caused by commensurately massive reasons, plots, and dynamic processes. <laughs> this flies in the face of chaos theory and its butterfly effect. A lone grandiose gunman in Texas can rock the entire world with a single shot by killing the young president of the United States. Yes, yes, John F. Kennedy. We also find patterns where there are none, and this is known as apophenia and pareidolia. We connect dots that should not be connected, that should remain discrete, and we find continuities in the disparate and the unrelated, including other people's actions. And we then take these actions, we connect them wrongly, and then we, we relate them to imputed motivations. And this is known as intentionality bias. Conspiracy theories 
are based on a series of well-documented cognitive biases and dysfunctions. Conspiracism is a personality trait. Even, even after a favorite conspiracy is totally debunked, there is a counterfactual residue left, and we call it the continued influence effect. The more you try to argue with a true believer in a conspiracy theory, the more entrenched he becomes, and his misinformation and paranoid skepticism become even more, more pronounced, and that is known as the backfire effect. Conspiracies thrive on ignorance, thrive on ignorance and nations. We don't know what causes autism. That part is true. Enter the anti-vaxxers. Vaccines cause autism. Another rubbish dump. There is a smidgen of grandiosity involved in conspiracy theories. People trust their gut instincts. They consider themselves infallible, like the Pope. They never make mistakes. They are enlightened. They are in the know. They are superior to the sheeple. They are adepts. They have access to privileged information with a tinfoil hat. How uh, nobody, a nobody in New York would know anything about anything in the world that's behind the scenes is beyond me. But he still thinks he does. So get rid of the ignorance. I have mentioned a series of uh, voices you should listen to. John Ioannidis is by far my favorite. There are others, Bakdi, others I mentioned, Patachavia. Watch my previous videos. In each and every video I give you references to sane, reasoned, non-conspiratorial voices. And today I'm going to make an exception. I'm going to, make a, I'm going to mention a conspiracy theorist with whose conspiracy I completely disagree. She believes that Big Pharma engendered or benefited from or somehow was involved in COVID-19. Her name is Pamela, Pamela Popper. And Pamela Popper, P-O-P-P-E-R. She has a series of videos on COVID-19 involving this conspiracy theory. Discard the conspiracy theory and listen to the rest because she is a very, very avid, thorough and rigorous researcher. Her videos are treasure houses of facts, facts which would render the political establishment and the healthcare establishment and medical professionals such as Dr. Fauci and others very uncomfortable, should at least render them very uncomfortable. Bill Gates gave an interview to PBS three days ago and surprised me because he advocated against social distancing and against universal quarantine. Finally, he adopted the voice of reason and he said that quarantine should be targeted. We should have point quarantines. Vulnerable groups of the population should be isolated, of course. They should be protected, definitely. They should go into self-quarantine and social distancing, if necessary, enforced. By law, all this I fully agree. People should not die, if, if possible. So, this man who advocated social distancing, universal quarantine, and so on and so forth, is changing his mind in view of the enormous damage that had been caused to the American economy. Losses by now to the real economy of something like three trillion dollars and unemployment shot up from three and a half percent to 13.5%, and that's only the beginning. It seems that unemployment will plateau. The curve will be flattened, and the people under the curve will definitely be flattened at around 20%. Bill Gates advocates universal vaccination after a vaccine had been found. I agree with him, but I think it shouldn't, it shouldn't be rolled out as fast as he advocates. I think it's extremely dangerous. This vaccine would necessarily interfere with cellular mechanisms of replication and, and self-regulation, with RNA translation, with DNA, with, with very, very critical issues in the human body. It should be clinically trialed, and it should be clinically trialed for a long period of time and on varying populations. Not like the Ebola vaccine. The Ebola vaccine was rolled out to black people, of course, without any clinical trials. Because white people were afraid that the black people will infect them. And black, black lives don't matter. But this is about white folks. folks. 
So, so we think, actually, here's the truth. A majority of COVID-19 victims in many cities, such as Chicago and New York, are actually black. But coming back to the issue, vaccines should be rolled out very, very slowly with numerous clinical trials replicated and reproduced and replicated and reproduced time and again before a program of universal vaccination. The precedent is very worrying. The only time a coronavirus vaccine has been tried on felines, on cats, the cats got sick. The vaccinated cats got sick much faster than the non-vaccinated cats. Herd immunity is still the absolute only safe solution. Vaccination is second best. Safe vaccination is second best. And apropos um, voices of reason, I would advise you to listen to the interview, Coronavirus and Dissent, with Peter, Peter Hitchens. Hitchens, that's H-I-T-C-H-E-N-S. Peter Hitchens, uh, in the Brendan O'Neill show. I would also advise you to read three reasonably accessible books, Molecular and Cellular Biology of Viruses, by Ferber Lostro, L-O-S-T-R-O-H, published by CRC Press last year, 2019. Physical Bio Virology, by Urs Greber, Urs Greber, G-R-E-B-E-R, as the editor, published by Springer, the publisher of academic texts, Springer in 2020, not long ago. And above all, Essentials of Epidemiology in Public Health. It's the fourth edition. It's written by Anne Ashengrau at Allies, the others. And it, it was published by Jones and Bartlett Learning this year, again, 2020. It's not the best book about the subject, but it's by far the most accessible, it's like a textbook for students, so you can read it and understand it. Many people have written to me and informed me, educated me, that viruses cannot leap across the species barrier. Species cannot infect each other. I have no idea where they got this specific type of nonsense from. Actually, 60% of all human disease is, is, its origin is in other species. 60% of, of human disease is actually zoonotic, crosses the species barrier. Cross-species transmission can be direct from the species to us, or via intermediary species, such as bats and pangolins. In many cases, there's no host shifting. In other words, in many cases, the, the, the virus does not adapt to humans as humans and becomes a human virus. Still, there's still a need to leap across species and to rotate between species. Even the flu virus, which has been with us forever, still has to rotate through other species. And it rotates through birds and, and pigs. So host shifting is very rare. But the COVID-19 virus, the, the covariant 2 of SARS, is a bit unique because there is no host shifting and there is slow mutation. There's no host shift in, in most viruses. Most viruses mutate very fast. Because they mutate very fast, up to eight times a month, the flu virus, eight times a month, they, they mutate very, two, twice a week. They mutate very fast so they can cross into other species. And so they don't need to be host specific. But a virus that mutates very slowly needs to colonize the host, needs to adapt to become host specific, needs to undergo host shifting. SARS CoV variant 2 is among the very few viruses, if not the only one, I'm not sure, that does not adapt to the human host, doesn't go through host shifting, but also mutates very slowly, which gives us enormous hope. This unique combination gives us, gives us the solution, gives us huge hope, because it doesn't adapt via mutations so fast. It's still heavily dependent on other species to transmit to humans and get them infected. 
because it mutates so slowly, a vaccine should be should be effective for a few years even, maybe two, maybe three years. And this virus is dependent on other species, so we can isolate ourselves from other species. For example, we can do what China had done after the first SARS epidemic. It closed down all the wet markets, the wet markets in China. It simply shut them down. And for some mysterious reason, probably corruption, it reopened these markets, which led directly to COVID-19. So we know we should, and we know how to isolate ourselves from animals which might infect us, such as bats. We definitely shouldn't eat them. It's not nice to eat bats. Ask any bat. It's, it's simply not nice to eat bats. I mean, what's wrong with you guys? Now let's talk about epidemiological concepts. In Iceland, there's been a population-wide testing drive. Like South Korea, Iceland is testing people randomly in drive drive throughs and drive-ins. And, you know, it, there's even a company in Iceland that does this, um, the, a group of DNA experts and so on. And there's a commercial company that does the testing. And right now the figure is that 3% of those tested are uh, positive. Now the 3% of the people tested uh, randomly, almost, it's not exactly random, because people are asked to volunteer to be tested, so they have their own reasons to come to be tested, but okay, it's as close to random as you can get under the current circumstances. 3% of these were infected with sars cov two. They had the virus in their bodies, and this is called incidence. But people derived the wrong lessons from this number, even even to my utter shock and consternation, people who should know better, epidemiologists, they confuse incidence, prevalence, infected, carrier, active case, asymptomatic case, presymptomatic case, diagnosed, fatality, mortality, morbidity. The confusion is enormous, especially in the, in the popular media. Before we come to clarifying these concepts, I would like to make a few comments. The current tests use a system, uh, use a technique, I'm sorry, called PCR. PCR is ta simply taking the virus and amplifying it, multiplying it, replicating it artificially until it's visible, until you can you know, measure. But if someone is immune, someone is immune and doesn't have the virus anymore, if it has what we call a low or no viral load, if his blood does not contain the virus anymore, this person using PCR will test negative. Even if he had been exposed to the virus, developed COVID-19 symptoms, recovered, and two weeks have passed, he will test negative with PCR. So the 3% figure is very misleading. Why it's misleading? Because it's a snapshot. It doesn't take into account the dynamics of the virus incubation, immunity, herd immunity. It doesn't take into account time. It doesn't take into account how, how, how many people are susceptible to infection. We call these kind of people susceptibles. We don't, it doesn't take into account how many people are immune to the virus because there's no antibody test right now. I mean, we have millions, tens of millions of people in the world with HIV antibodies, but no HIV. They don't have a viral load. They don't have any more the virus in their bodies, but they are still immune. They have antibodies to the virus. Would you say that these people have nothing to do with HIV? Of course not. There's something called transmission parameter. How many people infect other people? We'll come to it. And there are models that correlate incidence with prevalence, prevalence with time, duration prevalence, etc., 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 and I can give you the end result. If 3% were found infected in random testing, random incidence testing, you could safely assume that about 20% of the population have been exposed and have had an experience with COVID-19. This, this sits well with other studies. In Italy, where 20% of the population have been calculated to have been exposed. And with the United States, 
where the likes of Fauci himself and his colleagues are saying that probably 25% of the population is, has already been infected or exposed. This is great news because the COVID-19 virus mutates so slowly, if 60% of the population were to develop immunity, antibodies, that would constitute herd immunity. But in viruses that mutate very fast, you need the overwhelming bulk majority of population to be immune. And that would mean 90, 95%, 80%, you know. So herd immunity in fast mutating viruses, um, you, you, you attain this level only when, when 80, 90% of the population or 95% are immune. But with slow mutating viruses and self-limiting viruses, such as this coronavirus, 60% would be enough. If 60% were immune, this virus is dead, dead in the water, will never propagate again. Well, at least this strain will never propagate again. There are already nine others. Take, for example, <clears throat> um, conveyances. We have had several cases of populations which were actually captive populations. An elderly care home in Washington state, um, Princess Diamond, which is a cruise ship, an expedition to Antarctica. So in an ex excursion to Antarctica, 60% of the people on board were infected, but only six of these people developed moderate symptoms. There, were a, there was a total of about, I think, 240. Only six of them developed moderate symptoms. All others were asymptomatic. And to this very day are asymptomatic. 60% developed an infection. It's the same in refugee camps, in prisons, in elderly care homes, in Im immigrant detention centers. In all these places, e even though there are people with, with COVID-19 in all these places, there's no infection or there's no visible infection. Most people are asymptomatic. According to the alarmists, according to the Fauci's of this world, even one case should have been enough. Even one case should have infected the whole refugee camp, the whole, whole immigrant detention center, the ship in Antarctica, the conveyance. Even one case should have killed the entire lot. But we see that this is expressly untrue. There is no social distancing. In, there was no social distancing in any of the ships, any of the conveyances, any, I mean, the, the Diamond Princess, the excursion to Antarctica, other, others, there's been no isolation, no quarantine, no social distancing. There's no social distancing or quarantine because it's impossible in refugee camps, in prisons, in immigrant detention centers. And there are cases there, but asymptomatic cases. Why? Because in these places, I'm convinced beyond doubt that they have developed herd immunity. On the Diamond Princess, majority of passengers were old. Of 712 cases, 619 recovered. Only 11 people died. Only 11 people died. That's a fatality rate of 1.6%, but the average age of the passengers was very high. Actually, when we look at excess mortality, it's a mathematical technique known as time series. When we make a time series of mortality, when we look at how many more people died because, died because of COVID-19, we, we, we are getting some shocking results. The National Statistics Office in Britain has announced on the 5th of April that the excess mortality was lower this year than in the past five years. Fewer people have died this year than in the past five years. And this has to do with something called attributable risk or rate or rate of risk difference. We have comparison measures in epidemiology. We compare populations, durations, people who are susceptible, contacts, number of contacts, etc., etc. These are complicated models. And this, these models are showing us that what COVID-19 had done, it had replaced other causes of death, other mortality causes. So people used to die of the flu, and instead of dying of the flu, they're now dying of COVID-19. 
People used to die of heart attacks. They developed, they got infected and they died of a heart attack induced by COVID-19. It's not that COVID-19 was tacked on top. It's just, it's just changed the mix of death causes. And now let's talk about some of the epidemiological causes. CFR. CFR, case fatality rate. These are the cases which are fatal within a given period of time. So it's the number of people dead divided by the number of people officially diagnosed, multiplied by 100, but always over a period of time. If you do not specify the time, the case fatality rate is wrong. And again, as I am telling you to my utter shock, even when epidemiologists and virologists and public health officials such as Fauci and Birx and many others, when they are interviewed and when they talk in public and, and even when they publish academic papers, they forget this fact that case fatality rate is meaningless unless you specify the time period. And so they just publish a number, which is utterly, utterly uninstructive. For example, the case fatality rate of COVID-19 over the past five months is something like 0.607%, not 4%, not 3.4%, none of these insane numbers. And they're insane because they are snapshots. They don't take the duration into account. As you take the time into account, many people recover. Many people lose their symptoms. Many people, you know, you must take time into account. You can't just click a button. The five months case fatality rate of Ebola is not 0.6%. It's not 0.7%. It's a whopping 75%. 75% of people infected with Ebola die within five months. The numbers for SARS, the number of numbers for MERS, the numbers for swine flu are much higher than COVID-19. COVID-19 is still higher than the flu. The flu is 0.1%. COVID-19 is 0.605, uh, 0.607 in the best case. It's still six to seven times more deadly than the flu. But it's not nearly as infectious as the flu. The flu infects in a typical year in the United States 60 million people. Do you hear that well? 60 million people. COVID-19 had infected until now half a million. In a typical year, anywhere between 300,000 and 600, 290,000 and 650,000 people die of the flu in a typical year in the world. About 40,000 of them in the United States. The flu is much more dangerous, not because it kills more people. It kills less, fewer than COVID-19, but it's much more dangerous because it infects many more people. The transmissibility rate is much higher, which leads me to the next concept. And the next concept is known as attack rate, attack rate or incidence proportion. The attack rate of COVID-19 is far lower than the attack rate of the flu. Attack rate includes the clinically identified people, people who've been diagnosed, swabs in other ways, and you know, a virus was found in their bodies. Clinically identified, and then people who are tested, whose blood is tested. And this is known as seroepidemiology. A blood test. We don't have a blood test for antibodies. So we don't know what is what is the, the true attack rate of COVID-19. We just know how many people were diagnosed, self-diagnosed, mind you, because many people have mild symptoms. They don't bother to go to the doctor or to a hospital. And we now know that a gigantic amount of people don't even have symptoms. They're asymptomatic. It's very probable that the attack rate of COVID-19 is much higher than the attack, is as high, I'm sorry, as the attack rate of flu, in which case the death, the case fatality rate, or, or actually the death rate, of COVID-19 would be much lower, 10 times lower than flu. You see, it all depends so much on the time period and on testing for antibodies. How many people have been really exposed cumulatively, not in a time, not in a, in a moment, not at a point. And we do this 
via what we call cohort studies, cohort analysis. We create something called skew diagram, which reflects effects on age and, and so on. Also, epidemiology is very different when the population is fixed or closed population and when it's open. A closed population gains no new members and loses members only to death. So closing the borders and, and social distancing and so on created a kind of closed population in, in most of the countries of the world. So now we, we must apply the epidemiology of closed populations. And yet, a lot of the studies and a lot of the models, and definitely the public pronouncements of people, of public health officials and so on, they relate to open populations. They are valid in open populations. They are not valid in closed populations. The, this epidemiology of closed population has very little to do with epidemiology of open population. We actually even use different mathematical uh, tools. For example, in open populations, we use very advanced calculus, um, special um, type of equations, partial differential equations. And then there's the issue of infection rate. Infection rate is not only incidence. Incidence, to remind you, is how many people have, the, have been tested positive for the virus. But infection rate is the incidence plus the asymptomatic, plus the untested. So what's the infection rate? We don't know. There's the answer. We don't know. Anyone who pretends and gives you numbers and threatens you and panics you and so on is talking out of his head. The death rate, the mortality, is the actual death during a certain period. Period, 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 period. There's no epidemiology without a time dimension. So actual deaths during a period divided by the number of persons at risk of dying. Not the number of persons who were diagnosed, not the number of persons who were hospitalized, not the number of persons who actually died. Mean, the only denominator is the number of persons at risk of dying, which includes susceptibles, people who are susceptible to infection. And the only num uh, numerator is the actual deaths during this period. And the word actual is very crucial. If you die and you have COVID and you have SARS virus in your body, it does not automatically mean that you had died because of the SARS virus. Maybe you were asymptomatic to COVID-19, but you had a heart condition. The cause of death is crucial. We know that most of the people with, with a virus in their systems are asymptomatic. And we know that many of them had, have already suffered from respiratory symptoms. Many of these people have COPD obstruction of the pulmonary pathways. Many of these people have heart conditions, which, which, which affect the lungs, of course. It's a heart-lung complex. Many of these people have acute respiratory distress syndromes well before and totally unrelated to COVID-19. It's wrong to classify all of them as COVID-19 deaths. Actually, the National Institutes of Health came out with the most mind-blowing study in which they say that only one-eighth one-eighth of death certificates were got it right. One-eighth of COVID-19 death certificates got it right. The other 88% died of unrelated causes. And they say, yeah, but COVID-19 pushed these people to die. Had it not been for COVID-19, they would not have died. Well, yes, had it not been for COVID-19, they would not have died on April 6th. So they would have died on July 19th. What's the connection? You have to die of something. COVID-19 may have been a catalyst, but there's a huge difference between a catalyst and a cause of death. And the death certificates issued, especially in Italy, don't reflect this difference. They are exceedingly misleading. There's good reason to, to believe that the death rate, mortality, is actually lower, not higher, as public health officials are telling you. 
much lower than what we are being told. And if the death rate is low, then it equals the cumulative death rate, which which makes the <laughs> makes the situation even even much better than we imagine. What is prevalence as opposed to incidence? Incidence is is a snapshot. Incidence is how many people are acquiring the disease, and prevalence is how widespread the disease is. So incidence is like new cases, it's dynamic, and prevalence is static. How many people have the disease, how many are infected in a given population. But prevalence is, is prevalence should take into account, again, the number of people at risk of being infected. We divide the number of infected by the number of people at risk of being infected, either at a given point in time or over a time period. And so prevalence is tightly linked, closely linked to herd immunity. Obviously, the bigger the prevalence, the more the chances of acquiring herd immunity. And there's something called herd immunity threshold. It's the proportions of people immune above which the incidence decreases. In other words, herd immunity threshold in the case of, for example, the flu, is about 90%. When 90% of population is infected, the incidence of flu de declines. The flu virus finds it impossible to propagate and replicate and infect people when 90% of the population have immunity, which is precisely why we vaccinate. Vaccination is creating a fake artificial pandemic in order for the population to acquire herd immunity so that the virus can say goodbye. And that's the only thing it can do. It cannot propagate, cannot replicate. Too many people are immune. It hits the walls. It's like a firewall. It tries to infect this guy, immune. This girl, immune. The hell with this country. They're too immune. They're moving on. So when we calculate the herd immunity threshold, we should take into account the total population and something called two other parameters called the basic reproductive ratio and the transmission parameter. The transmission parameter is the proportion of total possible contacts, total possible contacts between infected and susceptibles that lead to new infections. So um, transmission parameter is about tracking. You're infected, how many people did you meet? Have, how have you met? And how many of these will get infected? Because they are susceptible. So transmission parameter is simply the parameter of how many people get infected from a, from in, in a population via contacts. And that's the philosophy. There's a philosophical reason behind social distancing, quarantining, uh, uh, self-isolation. The idea is that if you reduce the number of contacts, you change the transmission parameter and fewer people get infected. True, of course, by definition it's true. But it also means that herd immunity cannot be acquired. And herd immunity, let me repeat this time and again, is the only viable protection against a mutating virus. There is no other protection, none or a vaccine, which also creates herd immunity, but in an artificial way. Either way, you end up with herd immunity. A vaccine is simply artificially induced herd immunity. Do you know when this concept was first developed? In 1938. 1938. And there is, an, there is even a mathematical model it's known as the Reed Frost model. And it describes infections in a closed but freely mixing population. In other words, a closed population, no one comes in, like the borders are closed, but the people inside are mixing freely. And some of them are susceptible to infection, some of them are already immune. And over a certain time period, taking into account the probability of contacts between susceptibles and immunes, 
there is a mathematical model that tells us how many will get infected based on something called the basic reproduction number or ratio. And this is the number that made all this mess. Because this is a number that is traced by the WHO, by the World Health Organization. The basic reproduction number, or the basic reproduction ratio, it's known as R0. R0, R kind of zero. Um, it's closely related to something called the growth factor. It's simply the number of people infected by an, a single individual. Number of people infected by a single individual. As simple as that. So if one individual infects three people, typically, the basic reproduction number would be three. If he infects five, it would be five. Typically, of course, on average. Now, there are some types of people who infect many people. They are known as super spreaders. While an average person, usually in COVID-19, an average person infects two to three, super spreaders can infect 20 or 30 other people. And no one knows why, but no one knows why certain types of people infect many more people. And of course, there was the famous typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary infected a whole city. She was a super spreader. Finally, they had to isolate her. Poor woman. She didn't do anything wrong. She was simply walking around, infecting everyone with typhoid and killing half the population. So the growth factor, basic reproduction number, reflects this reality that people infect other people. Now, in Italy right now, the basic reproduction number, the growth factor, is one. It means one person infects one other person. That's good news. Because when the growth factor goes under one, under one, becomes 0, 08, 0, 07, 0, it means the pandemic is over. Pandemic is over because one person needs to meet several people to infect one. And that's rare for a variety of reasons which we will not go into. Even if you meet many people during the day, your chances to infect are very low because you need to spend a lot of time in close proximity with these people to get one of them infected. So when the growth factor or um, R naught goes under one, the pandemic is, is typically over. And as I said, Italy is one, Spain is getting there, and some in, in many parts of the United States are under one. Arkansas, for example, under one. And the effective reproduction number is how many cases are generated regardless of the state of the population. And this is a very important number, which is often overlooked and neglected. How many cases are generated regardless of the state of the population? We discovered in epidemiology that cases are generated sometimes, I mean, often, frequently, typically, cases are generated, never mind how many infected people there are, how many uninfected people there are, how many susceptibles there are, how many immunes there are. There is some kind of overriding constant, if you wish, viral constant, virological constant, and that's the effective reproduction number that rules the pandemic and this is this is ties in with self-regulation and self-limitation at some point the virus tells itself well it's time to stop if i kill all these hosts i have no future of course the virus has no brain and of course the virus doesn't talk to itself the virus is not even alive the virus is a an envelope of protein encasing a nucleic acid rna most often and dna in some cases it's, it's not a live thing. It doesn't talk to itself. People write to me, why do you why do you make the virus sound like a human? Why do you anthropomorphize the virus? Because I have no other way to explain it to you. Nature is like a giant organism. It's self-regulating. It keeps balances between populations. We know that. It's a fact. In ecosystems, no one population kills an, an entire population of another species if we leave them alone. If we don't interfere, if we don't introduce invasive species, if we leave nature to its devices, populations balance each other. Too many antelopes, suddenly the population of tigers grows. Too many tigers, the population of antelopes grows. I mean, and vice versa. Populations balance each other in a workable, functioning ecosystem. And there is no, there is no petri dish there is no laboratory where populations clash more than the human body. The human body is a giant container of 
tens of thousands of life forms. In every cell, we have an, a life form, which is not human, mitochondrion. In, we have life forms in our guts, in our mouth. In, we are like a giant, gigantic, walking, talking zoo. And so the virus enters this environment. It has to compete with other microorganisms. It has to adapt to acidity, to, to million other parameters. We should let nature do its thing. Yes, but you say, but some people will die. What's this? What's this phobia of death? Death is a good thing. It regulates populations. It ensures our survival as a species. Of course, we should do our best to avoid it if we can, but we should not be phobic about it. We should not be hysterical and panicky and insane and hypochondriac. We should not somatize. We should not go crazy. In other words, we should not commit suicide in order to avoid death. And apropos death, the survival rate or proportion is a proportion of a close population at risk that do not contract the, the virus. In other words, there's a close population, no one comes in, and there's a proportion of this population that do not contract the virus at all, or that contract the virus and survive it. It is one minus the incidence. And we work with actuarial tables. They are called cohort life tables. Uh, which resemble very much insurance tables, tables used in the insurance industry, as to how many people will survive and so on. There's something called relative survival. It's the adjustment of the survival rate for an independent cause of death. This requires mathematical technique, te uh, mathematical models which involve regression analysis. So we know how to separate causes of death. Anyone who tells you, well, we don't know what killed him or what killed her, that's nonsense. It's not true. We have well-developed mathematical tools that tell us this patient died of this, not of this. He died of a heart attack. He didn't attack. He didn't die of COVID-19. We have relative survival tools where we adjust the survival rate for independent causes of death. And we, we take as input mortality causes adjusted for life expectancies as well. Because the older you grow up, the older you grow, the older you become the more intertwined causes of death become. The, I mean, the older you are, the more at risk you are. When you are 20, it's unlikely that you will die of a heart attack. But when you are 80, there are like 90 causes of death that are competing on who would kill you, which, which one of them would kill you. We have to separate these to get a clear picture of what kills whom. And there's a survivorship table survivorship study. It's the prob probability that death will occur in successive intervals after diagnosis, any diagnosis. Problem with old people is that very frequently they die of multiple ca causes, systemic failure, organ failure, metabolic, di metabolic disease, multiple, combining diabetes, this, that, heart. Um, many of them are obese, which is an entirely different uh, syndrome. I mean, it's an undeniable, indisputable fact. 95% of people who died of COVID-19, assuming they had died of COVID-19, are above the age of 65. These people have three to four comorbidities, typically, all each one of which could, could have killed them. We need to separate to get the true picture. And then there's a concept called mass action principle. It's a number of new cases one interval in the future. And that depends on the product of prevalence and the number of susceptibles. We, it's a multiplication of current cases, the number of susceptibles and infection transmission parameter. But over a period, the problem in all the public pronouncements and analysis and models and, and epidemiological surveys is that they forget to take into account the time period. Maybe because we don't have enough time with COVID-19, but I don't think so. Five months is already long in terms of pandemic. Finally, the secondary attack rate, it's a number of infected within the incubation period after exposure relative to the number, total number of contacts with primary, with the primary case of spreader. Let me explain this again. The secondary attack rate is the number of those people infected within the incubation period after having been exposed 
relative to divided by the total number of contacts with a primary case or a spreader or a super spreader. So this tells us uh, the effectiveness of spreading an infection relative to the incubation period. If you take all these into account and insert them in appropriate advanced mathematical models, not not like the one used in, uh, with all due respect, Imperial College or Washington University, which are extremely basic, very faulty models, which always yield the wrong results. These are the models that predicted 1 million dead of Ebola in, in the West. And these are the models that are being right now adjusted and readjusted down and down and down and down. If you use proper models with proper mathematical techniques, the picture that emerges is 20% of the population is already infected. The mortality rate, the death rate of the fatality rate of, of um, COVID-19 is about either in the worst this range, either equal to the flu or one tenth of the flu in this range. The transmissibility is probably the same as the flu. And the number of dead in each country, consequently, will never exceed the number of dead of the flu we can say with almost absolute certainty that no more than 30 to 40,000 people will die in the United States of COVID-19, in the entire, entire United States. Be well and drink water. It's good for you. And it's said to flush down the virus. Another piece of nonsense.